have uh, time for a, a few questions uh, that George has kindly decided to answer. Yes. Excuse me, uh, could you just identify yourself? Jonathan Honig. Uh, two unrelated questions. The first, in terms of your long-range projection of one of the four problems, um, you know, the, we went through this with the Malthusian views of 30 and 40 years ago, and then we had successive green revolutions. We've been through it with energy and then tertiary recovery. And so I'm curious as to your views about whether robotics and many of the other developments that are in progress will end up providing similar types of technological uh, cures, if you will, to reduce the anticipated costs of a, of a different demography that will uh, assuredly come by 2050. The other question, just very briefly, uh, you mentioned about the Chinese, the relationship between the currency and the inflation issue, uh, but in my sense of it is that the deficit, uh, the current account surplus of China has been rather going up and not only linearly, perhaps even geometrically, I think it's now with the U.S. at about a $300 billion a year clip. And I just wonder uh, how your thesis uh, uh, relates to the data for the last five to ten years in terms of the progression of the, uh, of the current account situation. Right. Okay. Um, well, um, the, I, t I think, you know, technology, uh, um, including robotics, um, will play unquestionably a very significant role in, you know, for example, uh, you know, enabling people to live longer in their homes, you know, because obviously part of the, part of the, you know, the whole cost of age-related spending is actually, is actually looking after people when they can't look after themselves. So. Um, there are a number of kind of interesting things going on. I mean, Japan actually is um, is a very interesting, also very strange country in some ways um, when it comes to robotics. I mean, it has 40% of the world's capacity in robotics. It um, certainly is a world leader when it comes to, uh, to robotics innovation. Um, you can look at some of these things on the website, by the way, and there are all sorts of weird and wonderful and rather bizarre uh, products which uh, robotics companies have come up with specifically to do with old age. Yeah, so you have robotic dogs, uh, robotic feeding mechanisms, robotic hoovers, robotic this, that, and the other. Um, um, uh, perhaps we shouldn't go there. Um, uh, but the um, I, I'm not sure that that's going to prove to be the answer. The answer to the uh, to the aging issue, uh, how are we going to cope with an aging society, is really about how we address what is essentially an economic problem. I mean, so there's, an, there's a problem about who's going to look after grandma and how are we going to do this in an appropriate way and with, you know, in a civil way and, a, you know, without, um, so that grandma can live a, you know, perfectly healthy life and so on. Um, and that's perfectly fine. But we'll always be chasing our tail on that if we don't solve the economic problem, which is what are you going to do about the fact that the labor force is either shrinking, it won't in this country, it's just going to grow more slowly. Um, but what are you going to do about the fact that the labor force won't be able to keep up with the growth of over 60 uh, senior citizens? Um, and the answer to that is you have, uh, you can have, you can make good that shortfall by actually having reasonably high rates of immigration. I know there's a debate in this country also about immigration, but actually the underlying tendency for immigrants uh, into the United States probably means that you are amongst the better off of all of the major countries you know, facing this problem. Um, but there are other things you can do. You can actually change work practices. You can cheat people. You can just say, we told you you could be eligible for your old age or your pension benefits when you were 62. Actually, it's not going to be until you're 68. Um, I mean, that's, that's happening. And that will continue to happen, unfortunately. That's uh, one of the consequences. Um, and you can have uh, productivity. You can just make sure that tomorrow's workforce actually is, is equipped educationally and with capital uh, that makes them more productive than we've been. Um, if it was that easy, of course, you know, it would just happen. But we have to make it happen. And, and these are the ways in which I think we're going to try it. So that, in that sense, the technology is important, not so much about help in the home and how do you actually brush your teeth and all this kind of stuff. Um, but actually the technology that will enhance productivity in the workforce in general. So in that sense, it's going to play a very important role. Uh, so your other question about the China's currency and currency on surplus. Well, um, during the crisis, there was uh, a rebalancing of the world system. China's current account surplus actually fell very significantly. 
um, and America's trade deficit also fell very significantly, but it's kind of bottomed out now. In fact, um, if, you're, if you're minded to do so, um, and, um, uh, and you don't kind of feel that you'll fall asleep if you read it, the managing director of the IMF, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, made a speech last weekend um, in Singapore, which is actually w really worth reading. Um, I, I don't normally champion these speeches, because normally it's kind of official claptrap and, you know, you could write the speech yourself most of the time. But this is actually on the button. It really is on the button. And he says, you know, we've got an economic recovery, great, but it's not the one we wanted. Uh, and it's not the one we wanted for two reasons. One, because we're not solving the problem of imbalances between rich and emerging countries. We're relying on renewed deficit expansion and, and domestic demand to grow, and the emerging countries are relying more on exports. So whatever happened during the crisis, it's kind of changed direction again, not good. And the other imbalance we've got is something that's within rich countries and emerging countries, which are imbalances to do with labor markets, structurally high levels of unemployment, income inequality, social tension, all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought this was pretty racy stuff for the IMF to talk about in public, um, but well worth a read, actually. Bottom line really is, you know, these imbalances are growing again, which is not good news. Charles Kimball, to, to continue on with that, that one of the problems that led to the Minsky moment may have been the imbalances, and it was just a cyclical correction, and here we come again. Should we be expecting another Minsky moment in the next, whatever, short period of time, intermediate period of time? Um, I, I don't think so, to be honest. I mean, not in the sense that, uh, that you could identify that, uh, you know, in 2006, 7, 8. So the, the whole idea about the Minsky moment wasn't kind of financial crisis per se, but financial crisis that results from traveling through three stages of, uh, for want of a better term, leverage. Okay, so the, the final stage of the three stages of leverage is Minsky called the Ponzi stage, named after... Carlo Ponzi, who came to Boston in 1906 and was involved in this scam about selling postage stamps and, and so on and so forth. He actually did go to prison. Um, um, he, well, Minsky's point was really that when, when you get to the point where there is so much of this uh, excessive leverage in the system where actually borrowers have to keep borrowing money to pay interest on their debt, not just <coughs> current, um, that uh, you know, eventually what happens is the asset prices that underlie all of this debt start to collapse, which in this case was house prices, and then the whole debt mountain or the asset mountain collapses like a pack of cards. So that that was the Minsky moment at which point you know you sink into you know what could be uh, you know an economic depression unless you wheel out all the big guns of government and central banks and do unusual things to, to prevent it from happening. Um, so I don't think we're going to do that because we don't, you know, we still have high levels of debt, but actually they're not really accelerating anymore. In fact, if anything, they're gradually and slowly starting to turn down. So I don't think we've got, I don't think we're going to have a leverage crisis. We could have a public debt crisis, no question about that. So you could call, I mean, you might call that a kind of a, a Minsky moment, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the Minsky moment in the sense that Minsky meant it. Uh, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, let's combine a couple of questions. So there's a gentleman there. There's another question on this side. I thought I saw a hand. Okay, so let's go here first. <coughs> okay. Leonid Golden. For how long you believe Friedman economy would survive? For how long consumer society, as we understand consumer society at the West, can survive? For how long economy, where 70 or maybe even more percent is just speculation, when money produces money, can survive? Uh, yeah. uh, let's just take the other one too. Uh, we'll wait for my doctor. You sure? Okay. Um, so I, want to I want to make sure that I've understood the question. So. Uh, I, I think I'm interpreting your question as meaning that we, we're still in the process of producing not very much except speculative frenzy. Is that kind of the idea? And in general, mm. you have to produce and people have to buy. Yeah. Instead, they have to economize. 
to spend less, yes. and to consume less. Yes, I that's think only way to support the economy. That that and that's that defines in a way, you know, the shock that we're supposed to be going through. So I I'm personally quite. Uh, I mean, obviously, I welcome any bit of good economic news that shows that you know businesses are spending money and people are being hired again and all this kind of stuff of course you know we want this to happen i'm slightly distrustful of what's going on at the moment um, because i think a lot of it is happening based on uh, policies which can't be expected to last indefinitely so you know qe2 is not going to last forever in fact by the summer I would think that the talk will be that the Federal Reserve will be starting to scale it back. Uh, the tax cuts which were agreed by the President with the Congress uh, for two years clearly are borrowed you know, goodies from the future because that cannot last either. So we went through a period obviously during the initial aftermath of the crisis when people did economize, they did cut back, growth slowed you know, savings, personal savings actually started to, to build up again. We're now going through a phase which is actually not quite in keeping with what happened originally. Um, but I'm quite distrustful that it's going to last. So if you want a template for kind of what do you think is going to happen, mine is Japan. Okay, and I don't I'm not saying that in 20 years' time the United States is going to end up with 20 years of stagnation like the Japanese have done. In fact, I, I think it's unlikely that that will happen. But I think for the time being, the Japanese template is you have a series of kind of rolling hills of mini expansions and mini contractions and mini expansions and mini contractions. And I think that's kind of what's going to happen. Underneath it all, the growth rate will be very, very weak. Um, and that's obviously you know, a difficult environment. So at the moment, we're going through a bit of a mini expansion, but I think it's probably something that will be followed by uh, you know, a mini contraction some point in the coming year. Uh, but your, your, your fundamental tenet, I think, is correct, which is that you know, the debt burden has to come down before the expansion can start again on a sustainable basis. That's just empirically proven to be true. Well, I'm afraid our uh, Minsky moment has arrived, uh, George. We must end this evening. Uh, Mr. Magnus will be here signing his book, so please take advantage of that. There's a reception outside. On behalf of the Foreign Policy Association, thank you for coming. That ends our event today. Thank you. You're welcome to